Hi students, uh, I'm Dr. Gayatri and today we'll be discussing about disorders in the genital urinary system. So here are the objectives of today's session. Health assessment of patients with genital urinary disorder, identification of some common genital urinary disorders, management of certain conditions in the genital urinary system, nursing care of patients undergoing genital urinary surgeries and uh, also nursing care of patients suffering from benign enlargement of the prostate or benign prostatic hyperplasia and nursing care of patients with bladder irrigation. So first, what is urinary system? Now if you look at this picture you will see this is the human urinary system. It consists of two kidneys, the two ureters that drain the urine from the kidneys into the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder where the urine is temporarily stored and then the urethra through which the urine comes to the outside. So human, uh, when you consider the reproductive system in females, it consists of the two ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the uterus, the uterine cervix, and then the vagina. Now look at this picture. This is a section of the uh, abdomen or uh, pelvic organs. So here you can see this is the female genital system. So you can see the ovary, you can see the fallopian tubes, this is the uterus, and this is the uterine cervix and the vagina. In front of the female genital system or in front of the uterus, you can see the urinary bladder and the urethra. So here is the urethral opening, here is the vaginal opening. And behind the uterus, you have the uh, rectum, anal canal, and here is the anus. So you can see in females, this is the genital tract which opens to the outside through the vagina and in front of the genital tract you have the urinary bladder which opens to the outside through the urethra. So these two act as two separate organ systems and therefore in females when we talk about urinary tract disorders we do not talk about genital tract disorders because all the diseases in the female genital tract are considered uh, in a specialty known as gynecology but when it comes to a male the condition is different now if you look at this you can see here is a section of the male pelvis so you can see this is the urinary, urinary bladder in the male and the urinary bladder now this is the urethra so urethra passes through this is the prostate gland so part of the urethra passes through the prostate gland and this is the penis so part of the urethra passes through the penis and opens to the outside through the urethral opening so prostate gland and penis these are parts of male reproductive system so what you can see here is in case of a male person the urinary tract and the reproductive system the organs are uh, uh, what do you call it? the organs are common now for example the urethra passes through the uh, prostate and then through the penis and opens to the outside and semen is also excreted to the outside through the urethral opening so that is the difference between the male and the female reproductive and genital systems so in the females the urinary system and the reproductive system they act as two separate organ systems and that is why in females when we talk about the urinary tract disorders we do not talk about genital tract disorders because the genital tract disorders in females are considered in another speciality known as gynecology but when it comes to a male person 
says the organ in the reproductive system and the genital in the reproductive system and the urinary system are common we usually uh, in case of male we consider this as a single speciality we call them genital urinary disorders so that's the difference now we'll see some disorders in the male genital urinary system what could be the reason it could be due to some congenital malformations infections obstructions trauma to the genital urinary system tumors in the genital urinary organs or certain neurological conditions that can affect the genital urinary functions for example spinocord injuries that can impair the genital urinary functions first we'll see the health assessment of genital urinary patients so the history should include these things so first comes the patient's information so this includes name age sex address occupation and the marital status of the patient the chief complaint will be the main reason why the patient has uh, come in search of medical attention next comes to the history of presenting illness that is uh, in detail we have to find out about the chief complaints so this includes the common urological signs and symptoms changes in voiding pattern and the characteristics changes in the urine volume any irritative voiding symptoms any obstructive voiding symptoms any changes in urine characteristics then about the pain in detail about any abnormal appearance in the genital areas and any abdominal mass or any mass in the flanks that is in loins and uh, any sexual dysfunction in relation to this condition apart from that you should also inquire the patient about systemic manifestations of the illness such as fever weight loss gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea vomiting anorexia and diarrhea as well as abdominal cramps and distension so what is nausea when you feel vomitish that is called nausea then what is anorexia when you feel abdominal discomfort that condition is called anorexia this is not enough you have to also get an idea about the patients any coexisting other illnesses as well as about the past history of any illnesses uh, both the medical conditions as well as about the previous any surgical conditions the patient has uh, experienced or any past surgeries the patient has undergone so this includes history of urinary tract problems or infections uh, about other systemic illnesses the patient is suffering from such as diabetes mellitus and hypertension about any past surgical conditions or any past surgeries the patient has undergone and about history of any trauma to the pelvic region or any accidents the patient has faced which could have potentially that which have a potential of damaging the genital urinary organs right so these are the things to be included in the history so in detail since it is a patient with genital urinary disorders the presenting history of presenting illness should be taken in detail so these are the things you should inquire the patient about uh, his current condition in order to come to a proper diagnosis so any changes in voiding <coughs> that is the normal amount of urine output is 1 milliliter per kg body weight per hour and normally the normal frequency of uh, urination in a normal healthy person has to be 4 to 6 times a day and this should be more during daytime uh, than during night so the normal urine volume will be 1 milliliter per kg body weight per hour or about uh, 800 to 100 uh, 800 to 
1.800 milliliters to 1,800 milliliters or 0.8 liters to 1.8 liters per day or it will be approximately two-thirds of the uh, fluid intake within that day. So if there are any changes to this normal criteria of urination, that has to be noted. Changes in urine volume, what is that? The normal, I have told you the normal urine output is 1 milliliter per kg body weight per hour. So if the urine output is less than 500 milliliters per 24 hours, that is called oliguria. So it is suggestive of kidney disease, especially renal failure. So if there is no urine excretion at all, the condition is called amuria. So that is complete cessation of urination or complete absence of urination. So if the person passes more than 2 liters of urine per 24 hours, that is called polyuria. So it could be due to conditions like diabetes insipitus. So you have to uh, inquire the patient about his voiding pattern, about his urine output, the frequency of urination. Uh, you have to ask the patient. Next thing is irritative voiding symptoms. You should inquire the patient about irritative voiding symptoms like urinary urgency. Urgency is when the person feels as to pass urine but does not pass a lot of urine. So he feels the urge to pass urine but the urine output is scanty. That is called urgency. Then urinary frequency is when the person feels uh, as to pass urine very frequently. Dysuria. Dysuria is the burning sensation or pain during urination. Nocturia. Nocturia is increased urination at night. Strangury. Strangury is to have frequent painful urination but in small amounts. So you have to ask about any of these irritative voiding symptoms whether they are present or not next you should inquire about some obstructive voiding symptoms like hesitancy hesitancy is when the person takes a long time to start urination voluntarily that is called hesitancy straining the patient will have to strain a lot in order to increase the intra-abdominal pressure to start urination voluntarily. So this is called straining. Sense of residual volume, that is, at the end of urination, the patient will feel as if he has not emptied the bladder completely. So the sense of incomplete voiding is called sense of residual volume. Urine retention is the inability to pass urine. Urine stream changes like uh, there will be loss of urine stream and there will be thin urine stream. Interruption of the urine stream. Terminal dribbling of urine. Then urine incontinence. That is the person may sometimes pass urine without his consciousness. So or without his conscious control. So this is called urinary incontinence. So these are all obstructive voiding symptoms. So you should ask the patient about the presence of any of these obstructive voiding symptoms. Next thing is you have to inquire the patient about changes in the urine characteristics. So what are the urine characteristics? The normal urine should be pale straw in color or amber in color. So if the urine is too dark or it's red in color, it is called hematuria. So hematuria could be due to presence of red blood cells and hemoglobins. If, now the normal urine is clear in appearance and transparent. So if the urine is cloudy in appearance, it could be due to presence of microorganisms, scars, crystals, mucus, right? So you have to inquire about that. If the urine appears foamy or frothy in appearance, that is suggestive of proteinuria. So that is because the person is losing proteins in urine, mostly albumin. Then if the patient passes air along with urine, 
during voiding the condition is called pneumaturia so you have to inquire the patient about any changes in the urine characteristics about the presence of any of these abnormal characteristics during voiding next you should inquire about the pain now these patients will most of the time come to you complaining of pain so you should ask the patient about the location of the pain whether it's in the costovertebral angle whether it's in the suprapubic region or uh, whether it's in the lower abdomen next you should inquire about the type of pain so you should ask whether it's localized to that area or whether it is referred now when the pain well in addition to that pa pain in that area do you get pain in certain other areas as well so that's referred pain and then whether it's a dull pain whether it's constant or whether it's a spastic pain or colicky pain so that is to get an idea about the type of pain the character of pain next you should inquire the patient about any abnormalities in the appearance of the genital region so this will include conditions like hypospadias uh, that is when the urethral orifice is located on the undersurface of the penis then empty scrotum or hemiscrotum due to empty scrotum when the testis is absent on both sides of the scrotum uh, hemiscrotum is when it is present the bulge is present only on one side of the scrotum priapism which is painful erection of the penis then any lesions like inflammatory lesions cancerous growths or uh, wart ulcers or any other changes suggestive of a sexually transmitted infection then urethral discharge which could also be due to sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea right so you have to inquire the patient about these abnormal genital appearances next you should ask the patient whether there is any palpable mass whether they feel any mass uh, in the abdomen or in the loins or in the genital region so it includes a bulge or a fullness in the abdomen lower abdomen or in the genital area now this is hypospadias this is the penis so that here is where the urethral orifice should be located in a normal person so when it is located on the under surface of the uh, penis the condition in any of these areas the condition is called hypospadia so this is an empty scrotum you can see the testis is not present on both sides of the scrotum and this is hemiscrotum hemiscrotum is when the bulge is present only on one side so these are some abnormal uh, genital appearances and this is purulent urethral discharge in a patient with gonorrhea right so the other thing is you should inquire the patient about any associated sexual dysfunction so most of the time this will be impotency what is impotence impotency is the inability to uh, achieve or to sustain a penile erection which is long enough for the sexual intercourse so what could be the reasons for sexual dysfunction in these patients so it could be due to atherosclerosis it could be due to uh, following radical prostatectomy or cystectomy it could be due to uh, conditions like diabetes mellitus or Cushing syndrome could be due to spinal cord injuries or pelvic fractures chronic renal failure and due to the effect of certain drugs like antihypertensives so uh, this is the type of history which you need to take from a patient with genital urinary disorder so now we'll see some common genital urinary disorders and their management so here are the conditions we are going to discuss in today's session we are going to talk about urinary calculi bladder cancer and cancer of prostate so urinary calculi what do you mean by urinary calculi these are stones in the urinary tract so what are the parts of the urinary tract we have two kidneys 
We have two ureters, urinary bladder and the urethra. So stones, urinary stone in any part of this urinary system is called urinary calculi. So we give special names depending on the site of the calculi. For example, if the urinary calculi or the stones are found in the kidneys, you call them nephrolithic acids. If the stones are found in the bladder, you call it urolithic acids. So here are the risk factors for developing urinary calculi. So age of the patient, more prominent in male patients and certain ethnicities. Then family history of uh, calculi. Then chronic dehydration, then urinary tract obstructions, immobilization, then increased amount of solutes that form the calculi, environmental conditions, reduced water intake and high mineral content intake, then high calcium and more animal protein containing diet, sedentary lifestyle, all these could contribute to urinary calculi formation. So here are the mechanisms of urinary calculi formation. So it could be due to supersaturation, that is presence of excess amounts of solutes uh, that form the urinary calculi. Matrix formation, that is mucoprotein binding to form the mass of urinary stones. It could be due to lack of inhibitors that prevent the calculi formation or it could be due to a, a combination of any of these mechanisms. So these are the mechanisms by which the calculi are formed. Now here is a picture that shows the urinary calculi of different types, different sizes, different shapes and different sizes. Now depending on the composition there are several types of urinary calculi. You have calcium stones, cysteine stones, uric acid stones, xanthine stones and ammonium, magnesium, phosphorus stones. So these are called triple phosphate stones. Now what are the signs and symptoms of calculi? There will be sudden onset, sharp, severe pain, then flank pain, which of the affected side of the kidney, which then radiates to the genital regions or to the groins, then nausea, vomiting, paralytic ileus, then severe colicky pain. Now when the stone passes along the urinary tract, it irritates the urinary epithelium. So then uh, the urinary epithelium becomes spastic. So this gives rise to a severe colicky pain. There will be fever. There will be, if the calculi is infected, then uh, if you do a complete blood count, you will see the white blood cell count is increased. Now, when the stone passes along the urinary tract, it damages the epithelium and it starts to bleed. The blood is then excreted in urine. So, this is called hematuria. So, it could be associated with urinary infections. These are the signs and symptoms of urinary calculi. So, what are the complications of calculi? One thing is when there is a calculi, it obstructs the urine flow. So then the urine gets accumulated in the urinary system. So when urine is accumulated inside the system for a long time, the microorganisms can easily grow in this urine causing infection. So the risk of upper urinary tract infections. Next thing is hydronephrosis. What is that? When a calculi obstructs the urine outflow tract, what happens is all these urine has a backflow back to the kidneys. So then the fluid gets, the urine gets accumulated inside the kidneys and kidneys gradually begin to enlarge in size. So this condition is called hydronephrosis. So hydronephrosis most of the time occurs due to calculi obstructing the renal pelvis and the ureters. Next, 
when the calculi is present in the kidneys or in the urinary system, the pressure exerted by the calculi and the movement of the calculi can damage the tissues in the urinary system. And chronic infections can lead to renal failure. So if you look at this picture, this is hydronephrosis. You can see this is obstruction resulting in backflow of urine making the kidney to enlarge. This is hydronephrosis. Now, how is this condition be managed? Calculi, how are they managed? So, management of urinary calculi is mostly surgical. So, there are two types of surgical procedures that can be carried out. One thing is closed procedures. You call them endourologic procedures. You need not open up the abdomen. You do them uh, using minimal access. So what are these procedures? One thing is percutaneous nephrolithotripsy. That is through the skin you send some waves, shock, uh, waves that crush the um, stones, urinary calculi so that into smaller particles which can be excreted with urine. So that is called percutaneous nephrolithotripsy. Next thing is extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is you send uh, shock waves to crush, that's once again to crush the stones. Third thing is laser treatment or laser lithotripsy. So these are all different methods in which you send shock waves to crush the stones into smaller particles which can be then uh, removed with urine so without opening the abdomen the, that is why they are called endourologic or closed procedures if they do not work you have open procedures like nephrolithotomy that is when you open up the abdomen and you remove the stones from the kidney that condition is by doing open surgery when you remove the stones from the kidney that is called nephrolithotomy when you remove the stones from the renal pelvis by doing an open surgery that is called pyelolithotomy then if the stones are too big or if the stone has severely damaged the kidneys uh, sometimes the entire kidney will have to be removed by surgery this is called nephrectomy and sometimes uh, the stones may be there in the ureter. So when you remove the stones from the ureter, this is called ureterolithotomy. When stones are present in the urinary bladder, you have to remove them by open surgery. This is called cystolithotomy. So these are all open procedures. Now these are the endourologic procedures or the closed procedures. Percutaneous nephrolithotomy extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy and laser lithotripsy. Now, open surgical procedures are mostly associated with complications like pneumothorax, brachial plexus injuries, bleeding, infections and urethral strictures and sometimes they may even lead to renal failure. So that is why the open surgical procedures are uh, considered to be complicated compared to uh, closed procedures or endourologic procedures which we do uh, to treat urinary calculi. Okay. So that's about urinary calculi, about stones in the urinary system. Now we are going to discuss about bladder cancer. So bladder cancers or cancers in the urinary bladder are common after the age of 50 years and they are mostly seen in males. So here are some risk factors for developing bladder cancers. One is cigarette smoking, the other one is exposure to carcinogenic chemicals like benzene and chemical dyes like azo dyes. So what are the signs and symptoms of bladder cancer? There will be associated cystitis or inflammation of the urinary bladder. So the patients will present with symptoms of all 
urinary tract infection. There will be intermittent, painless uh, hematuria. That is, intermittently, the patients will be passing dark color or red color urine. There will be hesitancy. That is, the, the, the patients will find it difficult to initiate urination. And there will be reduced urine stream. There will be weakness and weight loss because it's a cancerous condition. And there will be suprapubic pain. And when the bladder, uh, when these uh, bladder growth grows in size, due to presence of a lot of uh, malignant cells in it, it appears as a mass in the suprapubic region. And if the mass is too big and compresses the ureter, what happens is the urine outflow gets obstructed. So then there will be a backflow of urine into the kidneys causing hydronephrosis. So these are the symptoms of bladder cancer. So how is bladder cancer diagnosed? You do a cystoscopy and biopsy. If you look at this picture, you can see this is how the cystoscope is introduced through the urethra. And a tissue sample is obtained for biopsy, for histopathology. You do the urine cytology and culture and ABSC. Intravenous urogram to identify obstructions in the urinary tract. CT scan to see uh, the involvement of surrounding organs or invasion of uh, malignancy into the surrounding organs. Now, how is renal cancer, uh, how is bladder cancer treated? So, treatment of bladder cancer, like any other cancer, depends on the stage of the cancer and the extent of organ involvement, stage of the cancer and the uh, metastasis, that is, on the organ involvement. So, uh, you have several treatment options to treat bladder cancer. So, one thing is surgery. So by surge, by doing a surgery, you can uh, reset the cancerous uh, tissues in the urinary bladder. So this is called partial resection of the urinary bladder. Radiotherapy can be given as external beam radiotherapy or internal radiotherapy. Chemotherapy or it could be a combination of these treatment options. So that is how the bladder cancer is treated. Next thing we are going to discuss is cancer of the prostate gland. So prostate gland is present in males. So it's part of the male genital system. Now in males, part of the urethra uh, passes through the prostate gland. So the function of the prostate gland is to produce fluid or is to secrete fluid that is contained in the semen. So the prostate gland uh, tend to enlarge usually after the age of 50. It's a very common condition which is known as benign enlargement of prostate or benign prostatic hyperplasia. And also the prostate cancers are also a common type of cancer seen in males usually after the age of 65. Now, unlike other cancers, the prostate cancer does not kill the patient. And that is why people can live with prostate cancer for a long time. So, prostate cancers are more common in males after the age of 65. Here are the signs and symptoms. So, there will be urinary frequency. Why? Now, I have told you part of the urethra passes through the prostate gland. So, when there is a prostate cancer, the prostate gland enlarges in size. So then it can compress the urethra. The urine outflow gets obstructed. So this will present with symptoms such as urinary frequency, painful burning sensation during urination, poor thin urine stream, urgency, hematuria and urine retention. So how is it diagnosed? One thing is DRE, that is digital rectal examination. Now, in a normal person with unenlarged prostate gland or with the normal size of the prostate gland, when you uh, insert a gloved finger through the anus and 
try to reach the prostate gland, the prostate is not reachable. It is not filled. But when the prostate is enlarged in conditions like prostate cancer or benign enlargement of prostate, when you insert a gloved finger through the anus and then you try to reach the prostate gland, it will be filled. So this is called digital rectal examination. So that is one test you do to diagnose prostate cancer. The other thing is transrectal ultrasonography. So you insert uh, uh, a probe through the rectum and you try to examine the prostate gland by ultra so um, by doing an uh, doing an ultrasound scan of the prostate next thing is prostate specific antigen so it's a tumor marker of prostate cancer so these are the tests which you do to diagnose prostate cancer digital rectal examination there the prostate gland will be palpable or will be felt then transrectal ultrasound scan and prostate specific antigens. How is prostate cancer treated? Surgery, that is prostatectomy, removal of the prostate gland by doing a surgery. Radiotherapy, if the patient is unfit to undergo surgery, the treatment option is to give radiotherapy. Hormonal therapy, why is that? Prostate cancers. 85% of prostate cancers are androgen dependent. What are androgens? Androgens are male sex hormones, that is testosterone. So in a male person, where does this testosterone come from? It's mostly 99% of testosterone comes from the testis. And small amount also comes from the adrenal cortex. So since this prostate cancer is androgen dependent, if you want to, if you have more androgens, you are more likely to have this condition. So, uh, as treatment, what you can do is you can remove the androgen source from the patient's body. That is by doing a bilateral orchidectomy. If you remove both the testes, then the patient will no longer have testosterone. So, uh, the condition will uh, will resolve. So that's bilateral orchidectomy. Apart from that, you can give drugs, antiandrogens, and do estrogen therapy, the hormone opposite to androgen. Right, so that's about prostate cancer. Now we are going to discuss about the nursing care of patients undergoing surgeries in the genitourinary system. So we have preoperative care care during the day of the surgery and post-operative care. So first we'll see the pre-operative care. So first of all, as nurses, you should evaluate the patient's knowledge about the condition. And if you think the patient lacks knowledge, uh, lacks some essential knowledge that he needs to know about the condition, you should provide the patient with proper information. Next, you should explain to the patient clearly what is going to happen during the day of the surgery. That the patient will be kept, uh, will not be given anything to eat. That is, the patient is kept meal by mouth. You give anesthetic free medications. Then, the time of the surgery, duration of the surgery, how you prepare the skin, the, uh, the surgical area is prepared for the surgery, and you have to give a good orientation to the patient as well as to the family. And at the same time, you should give them proper psychological support. Now we'll see the general preparation before the surgery. So first of all, you have to do a physical examination of the patient. You have to assess the patient's vital signs and the musculoskeletal movements to see the physical fitness to undergo surgery. That is not enough. You have to do certain investigations to make sure that the patient is uh, fit to do the surgery. So these are called pre-operative investigations. So these include the complete blood count, renal function tests, blood from gr blood for grouping and cross-matching, blood glucose, urine pool report and culture and ABST, prothrombin time, chest X-ray, ECG, ultrasound scan of 
kidney ureter bladder region. Next, you should obtain the informed consent for the surgery. You should advise the patient to take a shower and get into clean clothing. On the day of the surgery, the patient is not given anything to eat. So you've kept meal by mouth or nothing for us and IV fluids have to be given. Before sending the patient to the theater, you have to empty the patient's bla uh, bladder and open up bowel before transferring the patient to the theater for the surgery. So after the surgery, when the patient is sent, uh, is in the recovery room and then sent to the ward, you have to uh, take care of the patient by doing these things. You have to assess the fluid management of the patient. That is, you have to check the fluid intake and output uh, and have to maintain the chart. You have to check the patency of the lines, tubes, catheters and the drain. You have to ensure the bladder irrigation to make sure that the urine flows properly without any obstruction. And at the same time, you have to check the drains for the color and clarity. You have to always pay attention to the patient's complaints about pain and discomfort. And to relieve pain, you'll have to give analgesics. And uh, if the patient complains of any abdominal pain, tenderness, rigidity or any distinction, you have to uh, pay attention to that. And always look for vital signs and complications, possible complications like paralytic ileus, thrombophrobitis, pulmonary embolism, shock and dilutional hyponatremia because the patient is on IV fluid. When the patient is about to be discharged from the hospital, this is the advice you need to give to the patient. You have to advise the patient to be alert about signs and symptoms that may appear again, suggestive of recurrence of the condition. You should advise the patient not to do any strenuous exercises or uh, vigorous physical activity for the first six to eight weeks following surgery. You have to take all the medications prescribed by the urologist. You have to observe the urine for its character and for any signs of infection. You should attend the surgical clinic as recommended for the regular follow-ups because that is important to diagnose any complications if present. Right. So now we are going to discuss about nursing care of patients with benign prosthetic hypertrophy. So benign prosthetic hypertrophy is the old term. Now the condition is known as benign enlargement of prostate. It has to be BEP, benign enlargement of prostate. Okay. So this is benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So you can see. This is the bladder, this is the prostate in a normal person. So compared to a normal person, what is wrong here? You can see the prostate is enlarged. So this is urethra passing through the prostate gland. So in a normal person, the urethra is of normal diameter. So in benign prosthetic hyperplasia, what happens is the urethra, since the prostate gland is enlarged, the urethra gets compressed. So that is the problem with benign prostatic hyperplasia. So this is prostate gland. So benign prostatic hyperplasia or benign enlargement of prostate is a very common condition which you see as the males grow older. It is mostly seen after the age of 50. And the condition is worsened with the advancing age. So how is it diagnosed? Now, as I have told you, in a normal person, when you do a digital rectal examination, the prostate gland is not felt during digital rectal examination. It is felt only when the gland is enlarged. So in benign prosthetic hyperplasia, the prostate gland is enlarged in size and that is why 
when you do a digital rectal examination the enlarged prostate gland can be felt so what are the signs and symptoms there will be partial or complete urine outflow tract obstruction so this will lead to thin urine stream terminal dribbling of urine uh, after voiding the patient will feel as if the bladder is not completely emptied there will be straining during urination increased frequency of urination and if it is associated with malignancy sometimes there will be hematuria so how is uh, BP diagnosed first thing is the digital rectal examination since the prostate gland is enlarged it can be felt during digital rectal examination the other thing is blood test prostate specific antigens now prostate specific antigens most of the time they are present in it's a tumor marker of prostate cancer but sometimes this benign enlargement of prostate could be associated with prostate cancer in that case prostate specific antigens will also be positive imaging studies like x-rays ultrasound scans and cystography instrumental investigations like cystoscopy and urodynamic testing like uroflowmetry then pressure flow studies and post void residual so these are the tests which you do to diagnose benign enlargement of prostate so how is it managed medical management once again this is also dependent on androgens so if you can remove the amount of androgens in the body the condition can resolve so androgen deprivation by giving drugs like estrogens and citrotenone acetate testosterone sparing agents like finasteride alpha adrenergic blockers like prasocene surgical management there are several surgical treatment options to treat benign enlargement of prostate one thing is transurethral resection of prostate that is you scrape out the excess or overgrown parts of the prostate gland next thing is holmium laser in 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 nucleation of the prostate by laser you ablate the overgrowth overgrown uh, prostate tissues prostatectomy if the prostate is too large and it obstructs the urethra completely then you will have to remove the prostate gland surgically that is prostatectomy transurethral incision of the prostate transurethral ultrasound guided laser incision of the prostate so these are different different uh, surgical methods to treat benign enlargement of prostate apart from that you have minimally invasive surgical therapies like laser ablation microwave ablation and other thermotherapies to reduce the overgrown uh, prostate tissue mass in benign enlargement of prostate but if the patient is too old or if he is suffering from other illnesses and is not fit to undergo surgery the thing you can do to uh, to relieve these urinary uh, symptoms is to uh, insert prosthetic stents now we'll see the nursing care preoperatively you have to assess the patient's knowledge about the disease conditions you have to assess the patient's ability to empty the bladder and if the patient is unable to empty the bladder a urologist will have to insert a catheter you have to provide psychological support to the patient and you have to maintain proper fluid management after the surgery uh, if there is any hemorrhage you have to manage the hemorrhage so to do that you have to have an idea about hemorrhage so uh, because the patient can if the bleeding is too heavy the patient can go into shock so accordingly you will have to manage the patient so to do that you have to have an idea about the patient's blood pressure and pulse you have to examine the catheters and the wound drains for any signs of bleeding you have to check the patency of bladder irrigation you have to secure the catheter in suprapubic area 
to reduce bleeding and uh, post-operative pain has to be managed by giving analgesics every 24 to 48 hourly and by giving antispasmodics. Also, you have to check the patient for any signs of infection. So, uh, to avoid infection as far as possible, we have to uh, follow all aseptic precautions while doing the catheterization. For signs of infection, you have to check the catheter drains for color, consistency, clarity, and amount of discharge. And during the immediate post-op period, you have to make sure that the catheter is milked every hourly to make sure the bladder irrigation takes place properly and to maintain the uh, and, and the, uh, to make sure that all the blood clots are removed and the catheter is maintained patent. You have to check for the patient's temperature and any changes in urine and signs of infection. When the patient is about to be discharged from the hospital, you have to give this advice. You have to advise the patient to be alert on any urinary incontinence or recurrence of symptoms. You should advise the patient not to do uh, any strenuous exercises, but uh, and also to avoid sitting in one place for a long time, as it can increase the intra-abdominal pressure. To avoid straining during defecation, once again it increases intra-abdominal pressure. So to avoid straining during defecation, the patient needs to avoid constipation. To do that, you advise the patient to eat a lot of fiber containing fruits and vegetables. You advise the patient to drink 2 to 3 liters of water each day to take care of the indwelling catheter if they have any. And uh, you should also address the patient's sexual dysfunction, like sexual problems like erectile dysfunction. And you may have to give uh, have to refer the patient for sexual counseling if required and at the same time you should advise the patient to uh, come for regular follow-ups because that helps to diagnose uh, or to detect complications such as bladder neck contractures and prostate cancer uh, in their early stages itself so that's about benign enlargement of prostate, BEP. Now we are going to look at nursing care of patients with bladder irritation, irrigation, right? So what is bladder irrigation? This is that. So what is bladder irrigation? Cleaning or flushing of the bladder continuously using a sterile solution, usually normal veni, through a urinary catheter. It's what you call bladder irrigation. So why do we need to do bladder irrigation? One thing is to prevent clot formation. By doing a bladder irrigation, you make sure that the blood clots are removed and uh, removed after a surgery, after a bladder surgery or prostatectomy. To wash out any sed sediments or crushed calculus following lithotripsy. And then to administer antibiotics or chemotherapy in bladder cancer. So these are the uh, purposes or the indications for bladder irrigation. So there are several, there are three types of bladder irrigation. First one is continuous irrigation, that is uh, the sterile solution flushed in and flushed out at the same time using a three-way Foley's catheter. So that is called continuous irrigation. Second uh, type of bladder irrigation is called intermittent irrigation and closed system. That is, the solution is flushed in through a catheter for a short time and then later it is drained out. So this is usually used during antibiotic treatment. That is intermittent irrigation. Next thing is intermittent irrigation, open and closed system. That is the solution is flushed in using a 50 cc syringe and then it is drained out either by gravity or sometimes manually using a syringe. 
So these are the three types of bladder irrigation. So there are some complications of bladder irrigation. Bleeding, it can induce infections, bladder distension, bladder cramps. So how is the bladder drainage maintained? So following a bladder surgery or following prostatectomy, when the patient is sent out of the operation room, he will have an inbedding uh, urinary catheter secured to his upper thigh, connected to a sterile drainage receptacle. And the tubing will be of adequate length to ensure the patient can walk comfortably. So in such a patient, what are the nursing interventions you need to take to maintain the bladder drainage? So you have to check the drainage for patency. You have to observe the drainage for its color, consistency, content of, uh, and the content. You usually use normal saline for bladder irrigation. So you infuse, you have to infuse normal saline fast if the patient is bleeding too heavily. And soon after the surgery, uh, you have to milk the catheter every 15 minutes to make sure the blood clots do not retain and the catheter is maintained patent and you have to ask the patients to uh, bed rest and not to strain themselves in order to prevent bleeding you have to maintain the fluid intake output chart you have to make sure the catheters are patent there's no kinking or clamping and uh, you have to slow down the insulation when bleeding stops and the urine becomes clear. So after irrigation, you advise the patient to drink. Now, uh, once the catheter is removed, you ask the patient to drink 2.5 to 3 liters of water per day and observe the urine. The amount of urine, color of urine, and the consistency of urine uh, for the first few days and if there are any problems with urination you will have to uh, seek medical attention so these are the advice given to the patient you have to take care of perineum drink plenty of water eat fiberish food to avoid constipation you av avoid uh, straining during defecation, avoid constipation, avoid heavy strainers work for the first three to six weeks, observe the urine for any changes in color or sediment, abstain from sex for the first three weeks after surgery, avoid motor vehicle driving for the first two weeks after the surgery and you have to keep the physical activity to a minimum. So that is how uh, a patient has to be a, a patient who had been on catheter has to be advised on discharge. So that comes to an end in today's session. So in today's session we have been discussing about some uh, conditions in the genitourinary system, assessment of patients with genitourinary disorders. Uh, conditions in the urinary system like urinary calculi, bladder cancer and prostate cancer and about nursing care of patients with benign enlargement of prostate and uh, bladder irrigation. So with that we come to an end in today's session. Thank you very much for listening.